If you are a startup looking to grow in Cambridge, the Bradfield Centre offers a range of flexible membership packages which put you in control of your office and home working mix. There's a vibrant, collaborative atmosphere, on site cafe, plenty of green outside space, and regular member social events. For more information, visit bradfieldcentre.com or call 01223 919600. Welcome to the Cambridge Tech Podcast, talking all things technology from the heart of the UK's tech capital. Here are your hosts, Faye Holland and James Parton. Hi, I'm Faye. Hi, and I'm James. Joining us on today's episode is Mark Trahern from the Biotechnology Business Institute, who are offering Europe's first MBA in life sciences. So Mark, thanks so much for taking the time to come onto the show today. Why don't we start by getting to know you a little bit better? Why don't you tell us about your career, your journey, and how you got involved with the Biotechnology Business Institute? Thanks for inviting me and um, really excited to be here. Uh, Yeah, my background is actually originally from, I was brought up in Cambridge in the 1960s. So I've I've known the place for a long time. I then went away and was a PhD student here uh, during the 80s and kept going away and coming back. And so uh, I know the area well. And, uh, you know, set up quite a few businesses here that we've started and sold on. And, you know, some of them are still here in different forms with different owners. Got a bit of an affection for the place, but uh, realised that our sector in life sciences is truly international. And it's sort of connecting Cambridge with the rest of the world is the most exciting thing for me. So what was your PhD in? Pharmacology. So how drugs work. So in those days, the pharmacology department was up at Addenbrooke's and and during my postdoc there, it actually moved down into the centre of town in Tennis Court Road. So, And some of those businesses that you talked about, would, did they stem from the PhD? Or, and well, generally, yes, because I guess in, in, in pharmacology is drugs and therefore... Yes, I would say that. So I went as an academic in Switzerland, then came back, spent some time at Fry's down in Kent and lived in Canterbury, which I think is a great city. I really loved uh, Canterbury as well. And then set up a company in 97 called Cambridge Drug Discovery, which was founded here on the Science Park, actually. It was um, Unit 10, which sadly no longer survives. It was the oldest building on the Science Park. Roof leaked. There was asbestos everywhere. And the floor was black because um, the inkjet manufacturer that was there before hadn't really cleaned up. But it was it was really good. And we moved in there in 98 and started our thing. And then that seemed to go really quite well. Then we did a deal. We got acquired by an AIM-quoted company called Biofocus, which was uh, AIM Technology Company of the Year back in, you know, 20 years ago. And um, then that got sold on through various routes. It's now part of Charles River. Um, You know, still some of the people who were there are based in Great Chesterford, just south of Cambridge, you know, employs hundreds of people. So, we sort of started what we called the contract research organisations in those days, which weren't, you know, everyone thought every company will do it internally. And we came up with the idea that actually more and more work will be done externally, you know, through CROs. And we were one of the first, and we think we caught the zeitgeist of the time. Can you tell us a little bit about BBI then? How did that come about? I believe it started 10 years ago as a not-for-profit in Barcelona. That's right, yes. So I've always been involved in teaching. You know, I've been a sort of part-time academic. So, you know, taught at Cambridge University over the years, off and on. When I was down in Kent at the University of Kent, Canterbury. So I've always been interested in engaging with, you know, students and, and teaching but more and more been moving away from you know pure science to, I don't think you can say impure science, but commercial science towards things that make money and hopefully benefit patients. And um, I, I got involved with the BBI largely through a contact of mine, who's the UK managing director, Chris Howie, who I worked with in the government. I had a sort of government role um, a few years ago, and he connected me with Juan Garcia, who'd been running the BBI Biotechnology Business Institute in Barcelona for, for many years. And I've always thought Barcelona is a very interesting place. You know, I'm sort of old enough to remember the 1992 Olympics, which sort of transformed it as a city. And it's now, you know, one of the biotech capitals of, of Europe, I would argue. You know, a very vibrant place. And Juan had this idea of coming up with a MBA for life scientists, which, you know, I think is still pretty unique, if not totally unique in Europe. And at the time, certainly was. And then he said, well, actually, you know, we need to teach in English. 
why don't we do something in Cambridge? Because Cambridge seems an exciting place to start. And so we started um, BBI Cambridge really as a spin out of BBI Barcelona. I think it's a great thing. And but our students are, are global. Our students at the moment are not just in Cambridge, they're all around the world. And was Cambridge always the place? Was London considered or anywhere else well, in an English-speaking market? Good, I mean, I think clearly, I mean, the big decision was whether to go to North America, yeah. where there is more competition, yeah. or, or stay in Europe. Yeah. And, and I think we decided to stay in Europe because it's easier. It's largely because of time zones and yeah. things like that, and those sort of practicalities. And then we thought, well, you know, Cambridge is the obvious place. And um, it, it seemed, I mean, I happen to live here and, you know, Chris lives nearby. So we had a little bit of a bias, but we thought yeah. it's the obvious place to do it. Very different from Barcelona in many ways, but their, their commonalities, you know, sort of an interesting, vibrant city with a with a great future. Mm. Um, we thought Cambridge, because not just the brand, but the practicalities and, you know, all, all the lecturers are international, but we quite a few come from the Cambridge area, you know, so there's yeah. some people locally who we can call on and work with us on a, yeah. on a you know, monthly or, or yearly basis. The knowledge pool is... Exactly, yeah. yeah. So so as both operations are operating in parallel, what's, what's the kind of remit of Barcelona versus Cambridge uh, as they yeah. work side by side? So, so basically the way we changed it slightly... Barcelona was, it wasn't exclusively people from, you know, the Spanish speaking areas, although there was some teaching in English mm. and was very much focused on drug discovery and pharmaceuticals. And we in Cambridge thought we should broaden that to all of life sciences because okay. clearly pharmaceuticals is a big part of that. And I would still say is, you know, 60 plus percent of the course, but there's a lot of stuff going on in med tech. Uh, we even have, um, you know, electron aquaculture, you know, environmental things. So we look at um, life sciences as being broad. And, and so we think it's much broader, but of course, it's still very narrow in, in comparison with a traditional MBA, yeah. which will cover many multiple business aspects. So I think we have a broader, more techy type of approach. It's not just drugs and antibodies in curing cancer. That is a core part of it. But it's looking at all the different, you know, digital health and other things that, you know, artificial intelligence and other things that Cambridge is very good at, to be honest. So you are bringing other tech aspects and you just mentioned AI there. We did. So, we, for example, we have a company that is at the cutting edge. One of the lecturers comes in and talks about how they're using AI it's to, it's to design better antibodies, you know, it's for a sort of medicinal uh, purpose, but the fundamental principles are the same. And yes, we, we think, you know, it, it's not all about squishy biology. Um, there's, there's, there's sort of other aspects of technology that synergize and we're seeing a lot of convergence in Cambridge and globally. So when we first met and first started talking, obviously the big hook is the fact that this is being positioned as the first life sciences MBA mm. in Europe. So... I mean, that that's exciting, obviously, and that being based in Cambridge, I think, is a real achievement for the city. Mm -hmm. uh, so talk to us about the gap in the market. You know, how did you... How did you spot this as an unmet need? You must have seen a demand from the from industry or the marketplace for a, a specialised MBA in this area. So talk us through the kind of the, the creation process and how this got off the ground. No, that's a very good question, actually. And um, it was something I've been thinking about for a long time because I've taught on multiple master's courses, you know, over the years, you know, around the world, actually. And I don't have an MBA, um, but I've talked to people who do. Who I've worked with, you know, 20, 30 years. And they said... It was a really good course. I loved it, but I only ever used 10% of everything I was told. I don't need to know about all these other things because I, I knew I was always going to do something in life sciences and then I didn't need to understand all these other bits. So wouldn't it be good if you had something for those who are dedicated to life sciences to have something where 100% of the course is relevant to what they might do? Mm. And I sort of was thinking about that for a while and I thought surely somebody must have done this. And as far as we have, I mean, Open University, which I think is a great uh, institution, did have a, a life sciences focused MBA, um, but it didn't continue. It was a few years ago. And, and so we sort of did a bit of research on that and thought, well, actually, that was a very good course. There's a gap in the market and um, we should sort of set it up because, mm -hmm. you know, a lot of people told us that it's much more efficient use of their time. If people don't want to do life sciences or are sort of a bit curious about it, we suggest this is not the course for you. Yeah, uh, You should go and do a more general MBA or a more general business diploma, yeah. then come back to us or some other institution once you've decided what to do. But we think we think there's enough going on in life sciences to say there's a there's sufficient demand for someone to do a more focused, focused course. Well, that, that was going to be my follow-on question. You know, do you see this as a, as a standalone MBA or or do you see this as almost like a second MBA to a more generic 
general business MBA? That's a good question. Um, at the moment, everyone has done it as a standalone yeah. MBA. And we have been asked, actually, could could we just join this particular module because it looks really quite interesting. And on a very ad hoc basis, we've done that. You know, yeah. various companies said, look, this looks really interesting. Do you mind if we just join those lectures? So I, I would probably say at the moment, you know, and probably for the foreseeable future, you wouldn't do a generic MBA and then come do ours later. I think you would make that decision. Yeah. And, and a lot of the people who come onto the course have a scientific training. You know, they're either in a lab or have been in a lab. They're scientists. So they, they want to move from science into business. Yeah. A lot of people who go for a traditional MBA, if there is such a thing, come from finance into yeah. business. So I think people who would have a pure financial background joining our course would find it quite hard. Yeah. At the moment, I think it's a sort of alternative. Mm. Um, but I think, you know, if we do become modular in the future and, you know, we, we could maybe complement or work synergistically with more traditional MBAs that are around, you know, Cambridge and elsewhere. Yeah, and I guess that's a great sign of success, right? That you've got other institutions contacting you that are interested in partnering. Mm. Exactly. Yes, exactly. It's interesting, isn't it? Because we talk quite a bit about the curriculum and we had Tim Minchel on and he was talking about you've got to start really early on and make people fit for employment. So this is kind of filling an absolute niche. Do you think that this is a start? Will we start to see more breakout um, MBAs, if you like, in, in in different areas, not just in life sciences. I would hope so. I think I think it would make sense is if you know what you want to do, uh, you know, I'm joking a bit, we have one in artificial intelligence or something like that, but I, I think more specialist MBAs would be good. You know, some of the more established institutions will say, well, that's not, you know, you, you've got to have a firm grounding in everything, which is fine if, if that's what you want and, and you're going to go into management consultancy, say, and, you know, deal with a huge variety of different projects. But if you know you want to start a life sciences company and you really don't want to learn about this other stuff, obviously you learn all the basics that you would in any course. It's just the um, the case studies and the application is focused on life sciences. So you could come in and do our life sciences MBA and go do something else and still get benefit on it. But we would encourage someone to probably go for a more generic one. But I think, yes, I think we are starting to specialise. And, and, you know, life sciences is, is becoming a mainstream employment. I mean, when I was a young lad, which which was a long time ago, you either worked for academia or you worked for the pharmaceutical industry. There was no biotech industry in the in in the modern sense of the word. And now there is. And people have heard of those companies and people can see them around. You know, it, I, hopefully it seems an exciting employment prospect for, you know, the next generation of talent that's coming through. It's certainly growing. And we saw from the pandemic that there's a lot of interest now in life sciences and biotech. So I think it's it's, it's great timing, which kind of leads me on to you launched during the pandemic. So was that a good thing, a bad thing? Did you have to change your model? Exactly. Well, uh, again, we, we we didn't see, like many, we didn't see the pandemic coming. You know, we've been sort of talking about it, but we knew it was Cambridge. And one of the reasons, you know, we're here at the Bradfield Centre sitting in this lecture theatre where we are, if I'm not giving too much of the background story away, <laughs> was that, you know, we were thinking of having physical lectures with people physically being here. Clearly, during the pandemic, that was not a viable option. And we thought, well, let's just try it virtually because, you know, people are going to be sitting at home anyway. We, we could sort of wait until things change and we didn't know how it was all going to pan out with the vaccines and so on and so forth. And actually doing it online has been much more successful than I would ever have thought. And maybe because I'm a certain age where, you know, how can you possibly teach online? But my children, you know, have all done online courses now and just think it's totally normal. And I think it's very interesting if you look at all of us, I mean, I'm not you know, even younger people than me, you know, you, you're looking at, you were much more competent online than we were at the beginning of the pandemic. You know, we're not all talking over each other. We listen to each other. You can pick up the visual cues and that sort of thing. Clearly, it's not the same as having a face-to-face -face course, but having it live and interactive, I think, you know, actually works quite well. And we're getting, I'm certainly getting so much more used to it than I was, you know, two or three years ago. So are you going to keep it online or are you going to mix it up a little bit? Well, I think definitely keep it online because that seems to be a good model. And not everybody can get to Cambridge physically, you know, and they have other jobs or other family commitments or something like that it means that they can't access it. What we're thinking of doing is also moving to a bit of a hybrid model as well, where people yeah. will come here. So there's an option. So we have a project module, module 10 at the end, 
which can be a virtual project, which it, which it has been in, in, in the previous year, but it could be a physical project. They come here and work on, a, say, a science park company or something like that. And so we could do a hybrid model. But I think ultimately the plan is to is to have, you know, a face-to-face component. And I think one of the advantages of being here is you could, you could, you could run a hybrid model where you had X percent in the room and Y percent outside. I mean, quite how that would work technically and logistically, we'd have to figure that out. But yes, I think having a, you know, a, a, a two separate programs or even a sort of hybrid of the two is certainly something we're planning. Yeah, I mean, we've heard similar things from other education providers and event organisers that whilst the pandemic really impacted their ability to organise in person, it did present an opportunity to reach a much broader audience that, you know, would would have been limited by mm. you know, being having to come to a specific location. So is this giving you an opportunity to maybe go faster than you originally planned to reach a wider audience internationally? Exactly. I mean, I think because we like it to be live, we do record the lectures and if people yeah. can't make it, they can listen to them offline, but we, we don't encourage that. It does happen. Um, because we do it in the sort of afternoons, our time, that means we can capture mornings in the east coast of the USA and go, you know, far as Eastern Europe. So we have students as far east as Romania and as far west as Mexico, for example. Oh. So that allows us to operate in that time zone. And again, if we were to ever branch out to China or something like that, I think we need to sort of think about different time zones because it makes it sort of harder to do. It's enabled us to people who couldn't commercially or financially, but also practically. You know, they, they all, pretty much everyone is in some form of full-time education or mostly have a job and they can't leave the job to come here. And so what it allows us is to, you know, tell the Cambridge story and hopefully help their lives. Um, you know, but they don't have to physically be here every day. Now the week's Cambridge Tech Headlines brought to you by Business Weekly. This week we have news of deals and people moves. First, the deals. Cambridge Tech Innovators Bango and ICGO have both secured contracts in Japan. Bango has won a new digital vending machine deal with Benefit One who are a leading Japanese employee benefits platform. IQ Geo has signed a major new contract with Japanese company NESIC to deliver a utility disaster assessment solution for Japanese public authorities. On the moves, Cambridge Consultants this week announced that CTO Monty Barlow will succeed Eric Wilkinson as CEO. Eric retires after 31 years with the company. Monty has been responsible for incubating new strategic technology groups in bleeding edge areas such as synthetic biology, machine psychology and quantum computing. Podcast alumni Infosense have also announced some changes. Co-founder Jarno Voigt has moved into the CEO role with fellow co-founder Colin Payne moving to CTO. Be sure to download episode 5 to listen to our in-depth conversation with both Jana and Colin. And finally, a reminder that tickets are now on sale for Cambridge Tech Week, which is coming up between the 8th and the 12th of May. Visit cambridgetechweek.co.uk for more information. You explained that you've got a lot of history and roots in the local area. But, you know, through the since we've launched the podcast, we've been speaking to a lot of organisations that are involved in the tech cluster and bringing people together and promoting Cambridge on an international footing and all those kinds of things. So talk to us about how, from making the decision to establish in Cambridge, what that process has been like in terms of promoting the MBA, building the connectivity in the ecosystem. You mentioned, you know, academics and bringing people in to teach. How, how have you found that process of setting up and establishing the MBA in Cambridge? No, I think very good. And I think one of the reasons is that the one of the differentiators between us and anyway, if there is such a thing as a traditional MBA is that the majority of our teaching staff are not academics. They may have had an academic background, you know, as I did many years ago, but they're actually actively involved in the business. So oh. it's a sort of giving you from, you know, the coalface, so to speak. And, you know, a lot of Cambridge companies, you know, investment organisations get involved. They like to sell their story. I mean, my job as curriculum coordinator is to try and make sure it's you know, relatively on piece um, so that, you know, we can, um, we can stick to the accreditation system. Mm. But pretty much they're given um, a free hand to say, tell us about your experiences. This is what we hope you want to talk about, but what went right and more importantly, what went wrong, because I think you, you learn so much more from what goes wrong and Europeans in particular were, were particularly coy about 
talking about bad stuff, which I think is, is you know, the best thing. You know, a lot of these courses are sort of try and position that it's easy, it's great, it's fantastic, which it is. But you're trying, you shouldn't sugarcoat it. I mean, in my view, you should actually say things go wrong. And that's what I learned when things go wrong. That was the best learning experience I have. And you pick yourself up and say, now I know what to do better next time. And hopefully the, the people who come on our courses can learn from all of our mistakes and do it better than we ever did. You actually based yourself here in the Bradfield Centre. So what was, you, you know, you talked about this room. What what was the decision there and how have you found the ecosystem here? Well, um, so so again, I, I, I'm ashamed to say I didn't know much about the Bradfield Centre, but my former work colleague, Jeanette Walker, who used to be based here and we you know, had a role in the science park in those days, said, well, you must come to the Bradfield Centre. It's the best <laughs> place on the planet. So <laughs> I said, oh, um, and she said, yes, it sounds perfect for what you want to do. So I, I came here, had a look around and thought, yes, it is actually. I mean, I think it's got a bit of a buzz. You know, it, it's not traditional Cambridge. It's not sort of, you know, medieval buildings and that sort of thing. It's in a science park where you've got a you know a lot of life science companies but also other technology companies and it's got a bit of a buzz it feels like a sort of you know for want of a better term studenty place and um you know people like to come here you know my, my metric was how long are the queues for the uh, for the for the canteen or the coffee area they seem to be quite long so that seems quite a good whereas in some of the other and i don't want to mention any names here the queues for, for queues for coffee are shorter so um maybe that's a good metric to use i don't know james always likes this bit of the conversation in our podcast because he can just sit back and let everyone else promote the bradfield Center yeah. <laughs> yeah, well, yeah, yeah. It's always super awkward for me, but yeah, I don't take praise very well. Mm. <laughs> but uh, yeah, no, that's good to hear. Uh, we are trying to reduce the queuing. Yeah, <laughs> well, that's a good and a bad thing. Yeah, but, uh, yeah. yeah well, obviously, it, it says there's a market demand for coffee. So, yeah, 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 it's good coffee. Yeah, pro- probably coffee business is more profitable than life sciences business. I think it's one <laughs> of the highest margin business in the world, isn't it? Uh, <laughs> yeah. Coffee production. So there we are. So I mean, it, it sounds like you know you're off to an exciting start. You know what's next? How how does the next twenty four months pan out for you? Well, I think this is we this is year two. We're just starting now because um, we actually run from uh, we originally we thought we'd run academic year, mm-hmm. and then we thought actually most people are in businesses and most budgetary cycles and HR things are on a, on a calendar year. So we've moved to a calendar year, which is a slight difference from most sort of European MBAs anyway. So we're just about to start our second year. Hopefully, we'll get more students. We'll learn from the first cohort, and um, you know we get a lot of feedback feedback about what works on the platform. We're improving the platform because it's a sort of, a, you know, the user experience never stands the test of time. And how can we make it more interactive so that, you know, it, it's, you know, people come together when we have a lecture, but we're trying to encourage them to come together in smaller groups, you know, have ad hoc tutorials, rope people in so we can make the platform more dynamic and more interesting as a tool. You know, it works on people's phones. A lot of people do it on the phone rather than the laptop and just improve the quality of that and the depth of what we do. And also we start to rotate the lecturers, not because they're good and bad. It's always good to have, you know, every year is slightly different to the previous one. Otherwise, everyone could just listen to last year's recordings and get the same experience. And, and we don't want that. I know you've only done one year, so what would be interesting would be to see over the years our businesses started, our new collaborations started, you know, so do keep us us informed on that. But how do people get involved? You know, you're looking for students now. How do they reach you? We are. So so obviously we've got our, our website and, and anyone can can Google that. And I think we're on the Bradfield Centre website as well if people want to find us. Uh, we're on LinkedIn and other other social media. So um, again, anyone who wants to contact us can do so through our website. That's bbicambridge.com. And uh, we'll be recruiting again for next year which is uh, 2024. So uh, plenty of time to start the application process and, you know, download the prospectus from the website and so on and so forth. And of course, we um, always happy to have conversations with people who are interested in the course and want to know a bit more about it. That's great. Really interesting. Fantastic that you're here in Cambridge doing this. Uh, so th- as Faye said, looking forward to hearing about all of the amazing founders and companies that are going to be created off the back of the work. Exactly. And, and, and you know, over the years, so it's our 10th year now in Barcelona. And, you know, there's been a lot of companies created there. And we're hoping that, you know, some of the people will be from Cambridge, but a lot of the people may want to come yeah. to Cambridge and start a business, you know. So we are hopefully starting to increase the you know, breadth and diversity of the talent pool here because mm. people say it's a great place to start a business and yeah. how do I get involved? You As know? you say, it's about building that connectivity yeah. with Cambridge into the wider world, isn't it? Which exactly. Is a fabulous thing. That's great. Thanks very much for your time today, Mark. Absolute pleasure. And thank you.
Today's show was produced by Carl Homer of Cambridge TV and supported by our media partner, Business Weekly. The Cambridge Tech Podcast is available on all major podcast platforms and on cambridgetechpodcast.com. If you've enjoyed this podcast, please give it a five-star review. It will really help others discover the show.